We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm -hmm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Hello everyone, Richard Cox here and this is Martin Adams' conversation about the crisis in Ukraine. I think like most people, neither of us expected a Russian invasion, so we were both doing a bit of reading into the deeper history of Ukraine, and that's where we jump in, going back to the time of Catherine the Great. The concept of like a Ukrainian identity apparently emerged about the mid 18th century, where people came to think of themselves as, as Ukrainians uh, with the distinctive language and culture. And then Catherine the Great came along, one of Russia's supposedly more enlightened despots, and brought the Ukraine into Russia, annexed the country, uh, first annexed Crimea and then the wider Ukraine, and began a program of Russification, of suppressing Ukrainian culture and language and trying to make the people Russians moving the population around. And that was then the status quo throughout the 19th century, up until the First World War and the Russian Revolution. And at that point, the Ukrainians saw their opportunity to break away and go independent, which started a war then. Ultimately, the Bolsheviks won out and came to dominate the country. And there was some independence culturally and economically in the years Lenin was in charge. But then when Stalin came in, there was a massive Russification effort of the Ukraine, a massive effort to destroy any independence. And also, and this is one of the great tragedies of the 20th century then, um, Stalin wanted to industrialize Russia and didn't have any capital to do that. But one thing he had was the breadbasket that is the Ukraine. So he started exporting Ukrainian grain to the point where the Ukrainians had nothing to eat. And that's the, the famine known as the Holodomor then ensued. Uh, so we moved from people having independent little farms or 25 acres or more, whatever, into this collectivized farming where all grain had to be handed over to the state. And it suggested, I think the, the prevailing opinion in academia is this was more than mismanagement. This was more than just removing the food. So for, by contrast, say in Mao's great famine, uh, the great leap forward, I don't think Mao was actively trying to starve 30 million Chinese. That was a byproduct of like everyone making steel and this crazy system he set up, whereas Stalin might actually have been trying to starve Ukrainians to suppress any kind of independence in the Ukraine. And that coincides with moving people out of the Ukraine to work in mines in Siberia then on this industrialization uh, project, as well as blocking grain from coming in because they didn't want the perception that the Soviet collectivization experiment was failing. So grain shipments were turning up at the Ukrainian border and being turned away. So this is like, just to give the, a kind of background to the Ukrainian perspective of why some of them may be a little suspicious of their neighbors to the East. Like it's not really sure. a friendly bear, <laughs> sure. you know? So, and then, um, then Ukraine, uh, receives some more autonomy as the Soviet era progresses and eventually becomes independent in the, in the early nineties then, and actually hands over its nuclear stockpile to Russia. I think it's called the Belarus Accords, uh, where they, um, in return for a security agreement from Russia, they handed the nuclear weapons over to them because Ukraine was in possession of quite a, quite a significant proportion of Russia's nuclear stockpile. Um, so that brings us to the. Where does that bring us to the nineties then? So you then have the, um, did you look at the orange revolution at all, Adam, in connection of this? 
I had not. In fact, I think after it was after the uh, the Soviet uh, after the Soviets fell in ninety one. Uh, Ukraine, which was always perceived by Russia as being a uh, what do you call it? the sphere of influence, which is basically the uh, uh, the concept division over a state has over its like its politics and military, uh, and that Russia basically pursued the modern version of the the Brezhnev doctrine or or, or limited sovereignty. Uh, which uh, dictated that the sovereignty of the Ukraine couldn't be larger than that of the Warsaw Pact, even even though they are independent. They were always seen as part of the Russian Socialist Republic. But I'm not familiar with the... Could, could you explain what that is, the Orange uh, The Orange Revolution, yeah, sure. So this is 2004 time, and it's the start of... It's like a continuation of what in Europe first happened in Belgrade and had been going on in countries like Nicaragua before. So that you know, in in Europe, organizations like USAID, Freedom House, the State Department start sponsoring activist groups on the ground to dispute the results of elections. So you see that in in Belgrade, and then there's the Rose Revolution in Georgia in 2003, and in the Ukraine in 2004, you have the Orange Revolution. Viktor Yanukovych, who was more looking to the east, let's say, was elected. And the election result was disputed. This ended um, in half a million Ukrainians taking to the streets around the Maidan in Kiev. And something around like 20% of the country claims that they were active in these protests. They've turned out to be absolutely massive, contesting the legitimacy of the election and proposing that his opposite number, Viktor Yushchenko, had actually won. So there's like a really compelling documentary on this. And it's kind of heartwarming to see this power to the people movement to overthrow uh, a political regime that seemed to just being corrupt and in the pockets of the oligarchs and so on, and bringing in this hope for a democratic future. But the other side of that is it was funded to the tune of tens of millions from the USA, from George Soros and US government institutions, the kind of thing the CIA used to do before it kind of outsourced it to the National Endowment for Democracy and USAID and these kind of groups. So. That's not to say that the election wasn't fraudulent. Okay, it it really from the amount of observation of it and everything, it really seems it was. But by comparison, imagine if say Russian agents were contesting, actively contesting, and pouring millions of dollars in to examine the results of U.S. elections, which have been, let's say, dubious. Like the, yeah. I'm referring to the work of Greg Palast on. The two Bush elections, he thought they were both very dubious, particularly the first one in, in Florida. Or had you, like, Russian agents on the ground pouring millions of dollars into the QAnon phenomenon as they're storming the Capitol building in uh, 2020. So the US is not necessarily doing this for benign reasons. It's because it has its vested business interests or to make Ukraine a colony for Western interest. It wants it looking westward, westwards. So it's quite um, incredible. But Viktor Yanukovych was actually re-elected, okay? He, he does seem like a very dodgy guy, but he was actually re-elected in 2010. Again, with some level of dispute, but not the same level. Viktor Yushchenko was so unpopular by that time, he only got 5% of the vote because the, the promised reforms and prosperity in Ukraine didn't come. And then, so he's in then until 2013-14, where he scraps a proposed trade agreement with the European Union, and instead opts for a bailout from Russia. And then you see this massive uprising, and I think you're really familiar with the history from this point on, right. probably out of off. Massive uprising again. This time, I think around 80 people are shot. It's not, because yeah. in one of the really admirable things about the 2004-05 revolution was the uh, the revolutionaries were following this um, Gene Sharp model of nonviolent overthrow. And they actually had people who were dedicated to going around and ensuring the violence didn't break out and ensuring open lines of communication were kept to the police. And when the military were sent in, uh, they actually had contact with them and the military were advised them, just set up a few roadblocks because we don't really want to come. So set up a few roadblocks and we will say we're caught in them. So it was really an inspired, there's, there's a lot of, of good there in spite of the, the dark shadow of the, the CIA looming in the background. But in, yeah, in 2014, uh, there were a number of protesters were shot. And then there's the overview in this uh, overthrow and, uh, Petro Poroshenko comes in charge, who's again more westward looking. And that's when 
the the eastern provinces in the Donbass, Lugansk and Donetsk, lose faith in Kiev, lo- do not feel they're now represented when any Russian-facing president can just be thrown out. So they then go for a separatist movement, which starts essentially a war in which 14,000 people have now died, as well as like all sorts of atrocities going on. There was something called the Minsk Accords, which were attempting to limit that, limit the violence, bring it to a resolution where they would be remain in the Ukraine, but have like a semi-autonomous status. And one of Putin's gripes is they've not been enacted. So the violence is carrying on there. And that's his justification along the grounds of uh, two reasons, one being humanitarian intervention, and the second being security concerns over NATO's encroachment uh, ever more east. So that's my kind of narrative, Adam, to to roll the ball out there. And um, maybe you should come in and, and say a few things. Yeah, actually, just to, to uh, reiterate, because these are the two incidents, I think, which precipitated the conflict that we see now. And uh, the first protest was actually the Euro Maiden. Uh, which started on November 21st, 2013, and which was a large demonstration of civil society in Ukraine that went to this capital, Kiev, and um, had thousands of people actually protested against the the Ukrainian government's uh, decision to suspend uh, the signing of the European Union-Ukrainian Association Agreement, uh, which was basically the uh, agreement between the Euratom in the Ukraine and the European Union, which are separate parties, and which they wanted to establish a political and economic association between the parties. And their decision not to do so and stick with the um, Eurasian Economic Union and choosing closer ties to Russia, which is what Viktor Yanukovych, at the same time, these protests were actually not as violent as the protest that was going to follow it. And I think that's when we saw this slow, gradual degradation of what was to come. And like myself and probably many others, even a lot of people in the libertarian movement that I've seen didn't realize what was about to come. uh, And we thought that Russia wouldn't invade. And this protest, by the way, the year maiden protests only lasted about three months. But when that ended, And on February 18th of 2014, the following year, I think it was about three months, you had a revolution called the Revolution of Dignity. And it was basically a series of very violent protests, protests that you mentioned previously about people getting killed that involved the riot police, the uh, people from the public and civil sectors, private sectors. And it was some reports coming out of, uh, I wanna say, uh, there was an article from Vox, uh, which I have up, which is dated September 3rd, 2014, uh, which is called Everything You Need to Know About the Ukrainian Crisis and the Revolution of Dignity, where they said there was unknown uh, agents and groups that were precipitating, facilitating the violence. Now, whether this is speculation, whether you want to say this is the CIA or other foreign agencies or whatnot, you know, you know, good luck trying to prove it. But there was so much violence that precipitated this where they called for the complete overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych and the overthrow of the Ukrainian government, which goes to the two disputed cities, Donetsk, Donetsk and Lugansk. And I'm always saying it's Donetsk, it's Donetsk and Levant, uh, where they're actually uh, facilitating these rebel groups. Now, I just did a a, a video about the uh, CIA getting involved with these right-wing extremist groups. Uh, one is called the Azov Battalion. And for those who don't know, the, the Azov Detachment or the, the Azov Battalion is basically a neo-Nazi uh, right-wing ultra-nationalist group, uh, which is uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 people that became part of the Ukrainian National Guard. And they wanted to recapture the manipole from the Russian separatists uh, the Russian separatist forces in June of 2014. It was almost seemingly right after the Revolution of Dignity, this protest, that the U.S. government used the CIA to start training and arming these people, not just in the uh, the disputed territories, 
and not just in Odessa, south of the country, but also inside the United States. Now, this is coming from an article written by uh, Branko Marsetic, which is uh, the headline is the CIA may be, broading, may be breeding Nazi terrorism to Ukraine. And it's a fantastic article where he says the CIA has been training these anti-Russian groups in Ukraine since 2015 uh, and talks about training them inside the United States. Now, to those detractors of the uh, establishment left who are saying that, well, you know, this is just a conspiracy. When you look back at the history of the CIA, they have a long sorted history of basically uh, funding and training these right-wing militia groups that go all the way back to, say, the CIA's covert missions in El Salvador supplying the Contras against the, uh, which were illegal operations. And even after Congress passed a law uh, against the practice of funding these right-wing militias. Um, what about uh, the CIA's largest, most successful operation of funding uh, a right uh, ultra-Orthodox sect, the Mujahideen, which became later these uh, Salafi Wahhabi uh, organizations such as Al-Qaeda, Abu Sayyaf, uh, and the Islamic State Levant later. Uh, and they poured in hundreds of millions of dollars. It's that. The 2000 and, uh, third, uh, 2011 Timber Sycamore operation, where under the Obama administration, and which was allowed uh, by Jordan and Israel, where they funded and trained these, uh, these uh, Salafi organizations to overthrow the government in, in Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Fast forward to uh, 2015, just a couple of months later, where the CIA, again, is using a ultra-nationalist group to try and overthrow the Soviet government. And also in uh, in Operation Cyclone, incidentally, they were trying to destroy the Soviet government, which they did. So there is a consistent history of where the United States Central Intelligence Agency, uh, which is authorized by, of course, the State Department, to go and try to usurp these governments and to overthrow uh, either communist uh, dictatorships or left-leaning dictatorships because they considered them more of a threat. And that they, later on, when these right-wing militias or these right-wing religious organizations come to power, they can always uh, use that as the uh, future war on terror or the future war against these radical right-wing terrorist groups that are threatening democracy and the safety and security of US interests in the region. This is a consistent finding in our history. and. One thing I've noticed with the left and where they used to be anti-war during the Clinton and uh, first Bush administration, uh, the Clinton administration and the second Bush administration, especially the first administration, you had some semblance of liberal ideals. But slowly that started to change under Obama, where slowly we saw this side of the neocons, which was really ardent on the Bush administration, Bush junior administration now slowly started to side with the, uh, or extended to the Obama administration, which we saw the continued bombardment of the Middle East countries, such as Syria, Libya, Yemen, Pakistan, the Sudan, and the continued wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, which we saw the change in the Trump administration. Now there's no longer this neocon faction. It's almost this, now this like this fervent, religiosity within the right wing and the left authoritarian project, which has the uh, leftovers of the neocon establishment, Susan uh, Rice and Samantha Power, for example, Hillary Clinton, which has a, still an influence in the, the, the Democrat establishment. So now we're starting to see a change. So this leftist is still trying to push the war with, with Russia, where you have the right, basically this ultra-nationalist uh, group, ultra-religious group, basically against the war with Russia, but trying to facilitate the war with China. So either way, either if, we, uh, if you're siding with either uh, party itself, it's a losing proposition, because we'll either have a, a, a continued conflict with, with Russia, or we might have a potential conflict with China. In fact, I, I think 
I tweeted this the other day where I said that the Ukrainian-Russia crisis is basically a test run for the uh, China-Taiwan uh, crisis. And this comes right at the heel of the most, probably one of the most important elections that we have inside the United States is for the House and Senate in 2022 in November. And all of a sudden, what has taken a backseat? COVID, actually. So now we are concentrating on the conflicts. What is going to precipitate from this? Yeah. Uh, well, the war on terror took a backseat when COVID came along. Like, sure do you. Terrorist Muslims were no longer scary. They had a lot of reinvigoration of ISIS in the middle of the thing when, yeah. when Al Qaeda stopped being scary. So you needed like, it's like the the sequel to Dracula film where they do this really hammy worse than Dracula <laughs> thing, and you had that with ISIS. It's worse than Al Qaeda. Um, but there, there's, I was just looking at some military think tank strategists saying that the the border with Russia, the European border of Russia needs to be secured prior to a war with China starting. So that's why they need the missile defenses there and everything. So it's, it's kind of part of the same strategy in that sense. There's also, I noticed something too, Richard, there's, there's also a lack of mediation here. I'm a little bit, I'm not, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't say this, but I'm not surprised. Although I always say I'm surprised, but I, I'm not actually. The United States, in response, immediately Biden, especially Joe, President Biden, basically went and said, well, we're going to add additional sanctions to the Russian economy, which basically a lot of people tend to disagree. But, you know, economic sanctions are, uh, uh, are a war crime, in my view. Uh, they're a war crime. And basically because it doesn't affect the billionaire oligarchs, which he's saying that he wants to suppress. Uh, basically, I think um, uh, France and Germany has come out and said, we're trying to suppress the billionaire oligarchs. No, I mean, we have talked about this before, where sanctions tend to hurt the weakest part of society. Uh, and one of, the, one of which we discussed in length was about the oil for food program in the first Gulf War, in which 500,000, approximately 500,000 uh, elderly men and women and children were killed. And Osama bin Laden basically even came out and said this is one of the reasons why he has this disdain for uh, American foreign policy. So fast forward to this economic sanctions, additional, by the way, on top of these sanctions already. So additional sanctions were basically going to hurt the Russian society mm. itself, the poorest regions, of course. Um, and so it's not going to hurt Putin. It's not going to hurt the oligarchs of the Russian uh, Federation. This is going to hurt the people in which this is basically going to be adding to fuel to the fire, so to speak, about the hatred be for the West or the new re revigoration of the Cold War, so to speak. Um, and so just recently, I just read this article where um, the Ukrainian government basically wants Foreign Minister, Israeli Foreign Minister Yair Lapid to undertake um, mediation between Russia and the Ukraine. I don't know whether this is going to be uh, fruitful, but I think it's ironic, so to speak, because uh, the wave of anti-Semitism is coming from this small uh, radical ultra-nationalist populace in the Ukraine, in which the Russians are basically trying to defeat at the same time, trying to replace this illegitimate government uh, under um, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. And I, you know, I want to say that the last legitimate government was uh, under uh, um, Yanukovych. Yanukovych. So, yeah, you. well, Yanukovych. I, I do question whether any uh, Ukrainian government has ever been really democratically legitimate. There does seem to be sure. fraud in every election there. Um, like even Yanukovych's predecessor, Lena uh, Kuchma, was on tape arranging for the disappearance of a journalist. You know, Yanukovych himself was a, a criminal in his youth, and it it does it, it doesn't seem like there's a way to win in Ukraine in terms of elections. It's right. like, you know, well, where is there anywhere? But basically, right. but yeah, I I mean, I, I see what you um, I see what you're seeing there. Like, yeah, you can see that that 2010 election perhaps had some legitimacy. Well, it was contested, 
uh, by uh, Yulia Tymoshenko. I just, you know, I just posted a, a long thread about the CIA's program with the right-wing nationalists uh, in the separatist areas. And one thing I, I, I saw was that the leader of the, one of the leaders of the Azov Battalion basically said, we're not, at, we're not at conflict with Putin because he's a Russian. He's not Russian, he's a Jew. And it's all, it's all, and the Daily Beast did that article basically. So if anybody wants to check it out, it's still on my profile. It's a long uh, thread. And I, I find that fascinating because there is a, now take this with a grain of salt uh, because there's so much disinformation about this conflict. It's almost immediate. It's, you know, you know, what videos are we looking at? What's the date and these, and there's such a disinformation campaign coming because in the United States, everything is politicized. I don't, I can't say that with other countries in the world, but I can say with confidence and everything in the United States is politicized. So whereas knowledge is not the important aspect, it's about belief. And that belief is desensitized with disinformation, misinformation, and outright lies. So you don't know what to believe. So you're, it's almost like you're in a state of paralysis. So with the, I, I read somewhere on Twitter where basically uh, the Israeli Mossad had been sending weapons to these neo-Nazi battalion groups in the Ukraine. I couldn't find any type of uh, documentation for this, uh, but there was some rumor coming from um, certain reputable journalists left on Twitter, like um, Aaron Maté and uh, uh, I've, oh, I forgot the other guy's name. It was pretty damn good so far, uh, and I'm gonna. I, I feel sorry because I follow him. So, but they they were talking about this. Uh, because what they want is a continued conflict. And usually when they're trying to precipitate or uh, facilitate a conflict, something is happening behind the scenes. Now, what that is, we don't know yet because it's not uh, revealed. But usually something is happening behind the scenes. Uh, and whether it's legislature, whether it's bills are being passed or whatnot, but something else is going on. And yes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. We saw this in the 1980 Afghan Soviet war. We saw this in the conflicts in, in Iraq, in, especially with the civil wars in 2003 and 2006, uh, until they're no longer your, your friend, they're your enemy. So there's always this switch of sides that is going to happen uh, within theater of war. You don't never know. And uh, I go back to Aetius the Greek, where he says this remarkable quote that I use from time to time, the first casualty of war is the truth. And this conflict between Russia and the Ukraine uh, goes back to even, you know, the early 12th century. I have to mention, and I'm not going to get into detail about this, Patrick McFarlane of Liberty Weekly is going to do a podcast where he's going to talk about this, this battle between the churches uh, in the Ukraine, where the, orth the Orthodox Church of the Ukraine or the OCU is at odds with the R Moscow Russian Orthodox Church or the ROC that goes back, you know, centuries. And I never knew this. And this is new to me because I one thing I'm doing is I'm still learning about this conflict. And I had no idea it goes back that far, where the churches themselves are basically these powerful institutions are at odds with one another. And they have such wide conf uh, wide uh, influence that goes to the Belarus, uh, Eastern Europe. And I had no idea, but this is actually important because it details the history that still goes on to today. And there's this rift in 2018 between the churches, but I'm not going to ruin it for them, but I just wanted to mention that a little bit as well. Yeah, it is the case that the Israelis have been supplying the Ukrainians with weapons because there's Jewish human rights groups have spoken out about it. But have they? Have they? It, I don't, it's hard to get at what the underpinning ideology of the Azov Battalion is, or even to suggest that they have a consistent underpinning ideology between different members, because there are Jewish people fighting in the Azov Battalion, which is, you know, you could say like more than Turkey's voting for Christmas, that might be... Turkey's actually going out and, and organizing the festival itself. You know? Yes, <laughs> um, yeah, right. I, 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 yeah, it's 
the the um i read that what sounds like the article you read i read it in the guardian and the one from the daily beast um right. traveling with house of Italian members who said like they're not anti-semitic and neither was hitler because the holocaust didn't happen then so that kind of thing right so it's right. it all gets very confused and yeah I, I mean i'm sure you could be like extremely hard right now like we're not living in the 1940s anymore so i don't think i don't think jews necessarily have the preoccupation in the european psyche that they did for a thousand years leading up to recently maybe i'm wrong but that that just seems to be like not so much of the thing um did you see uh, vladimir putin's speech i saw part of it so I, I listened to the whole thing i probably could have read it in half the time right but i i actually listened to it and just read the transcript as it came up to get a sense of, of putin speaking and i think one thing is just step back from all context and everything it's quite a thing to watch a head of state sit down and give an hour's talk and say first we must start with history and go back hundreds of years and then come up and talk a lot about 1917 to 20 and move on from there like can you imagine a u.s president doing that in recent can you imagine it? you know um it, it's just the, the sort of intellectual level and even if you disagree with what Putin was saying you go he, he's clearly a student of history and he clearly feels very very passionately about the Soviet Union and I could see like I've heard people reference that speech and say you see this is evidence that Putin is the new Stalin and he's wanting to resurrect the Iron Curtain and retake the borders the Soviet Union had prior to the um the Berlin Wall coming down and I can sort of see what it, it started out feeling a bit that way because he is talking about the tragedy of the loss of the union and how it was a terrible mistake to give these provinces that level of independence where they could m move into secession and um, so he's clearly not happy about the way things worked out but it doesn't go on to suggest that this is some project to to resurrect the union and I think that's that's a meme that's emerged on the political right of them, probably on the political left too. But a lot of people I've been listening to over COVID because of an ideological alliance in that regard has snapped now very strongly into Putin is going to take over Europe. You know, he's going to be, it's going to be Russian tanks traveling down to the Iberian Peninsula in, in right. three to five years time. Okay. Well, we're playing command and conquer red alert now. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Adam. That was a big game in my no. childhood. Like, oh, it's an alternative history timeline game where, um, the Second World War didn't happen, and then Stalin attempted to take over Europe. Um, and listening to Putin's speech, he doesn't sound like that at all. He sounds like someone who feels his heels, and by extension, the heels of Russia, are over a cliff edge, and they're being pushed back and back and back by this expansive NATO alliance, which is really just the United States, because the United States cannot cannot contemplate having a strong, independent country like Russia in the world. It wants to be this monopolar power. And that Russia has made all the concessions for the past 30 years. It's done nothing but concede and concede and concede. And the United States has broken all the promises regarding not expanding NATO. So I think everyone's familiar with this, but the agreement made in the 1990s was that Germany could reunify and join NATO as long as NATO didn't go one inch further into the east. And that's been completely disregarded at a time when Russia was powerless to do anything about it. So and obviously the comparisons made you know, if Russia formed a security alliance with Mexico and Canada and put missiles on the border, this would never be acceptable to the United States. So that's at the heart of a lot of this. I think Putin sees either through some kind of color revolution, ultimately in Moscow, or through a direct military confrontation, or through such a strong containment that Russia is going to be neutered on the global stage. And it's going to be the 1990s all over again when Western oligarchs went in and just gutted Russia when they had a compliant Boris Yeltsin in there. And I think what they wanted in, in Putin, and because Bill Clinton is um, on record as being happy, communicating with Boris Yeltsin and being happy about Putin's essentially appointment, uh, the kind of rigging of the elections in Russia there, so to get Putin into power, or, or Yeltsin's uh, giving him the, the nod and setting him up to become the next Russian president, is that he would be like a sober Yeltsin. He would allow the Western plunder of Russia to continue. and Putin didn't allow that to continue. And that's why the West is ultimately like hostile to him because he is this strong nationalist figure. And he doesn't seem propagandous about the, um, like, I don't think he spoke in his speech 
probably as much as maybe you could, well, certainly not as much as you wanted, about what Russia had inflicted upon the Ukraine in terms of the starvation. Um, but, like, neither did he shy away from the atrocities of the Stalinist era. Okay, so he doesn't have some, and that, that's all, like, quite open. What happened in Russia is quite open now, that Stalin was a tyrant and all the rest. So, yeah, it's, um, but it's the perception, and I think it's a, a total fantasy, but the perception in the Western media that Putin is going to invade all these different countries. Um, but even if I acknowledge, okay, well, maybe that's true. Okay, maybe the, let, let's, how would I know, right? Maybe Putin will unzip himself one day and Joseph Stalin will step out and go, ha, surprise, be, it's been old school communism all along. Um, there's no way to make that case whilst Putin has genuine security concerns and there's a genuine humanitarian reason uh, for this involvement in the Ukraine. And I say that without justifying it, right? Because even humanitarian interventions that are done for reasons as pure as the driven snow can easily make things worse, like a lot worse. And it's one of the um, the young activists who was involved back in the, the Orange Revolution uh, went on to be uh, an MP um, in in Kiev. And she was talking about like her elderly father going out to defend Kiev and he can barely walk anymore and she's crying when she's saying it. And it, it's absolutely, it must be horrendous to live in, in the Ukraine at the moment and have this foisted upon you. But it's not just pushed upon you by Russia. It's like various forces around the globe, including the United States, have come together to have this kicking match in the Ukraine. This war is basically a war on multiple fronts. So it's not as black and white as uh, the people of the left and right are making it on viral media. One could see this war as a religious war between the two churches. Two, one could see this war as basically a war against NATO and the United States and the allied partners. You could see this war as basically a fight for Russian sovereignty uh, and basically a war of attrition. Putin has made it quite clear in that speech that he's being transparent. Uh, one, there's one quote where he basically says that, um, where he says, we've been transparent with the world and we shared the classified evidence about Russia's plans and cyber attacks and full pretext so there could be no confusion or cover up, uh, a cover up about what we're doing. And I think you hit an important point regarding that this could be far worse than what is being shown. Aside from the disinformation, aside from the misleading videos that we're seeing online, not everything is totally false. Not everything is totally true. But if you can see through the red tape and do your due diligence and do your research without any biased mentality, a biased mindset through the more, more polarizing political lens, you can actually gain into the great world of what is happening right now. And once you do, you'll notice that this is not basically about just Russia or the Ukraine. It's basically about the United States, NATO, the allied partners, uh, the Russian Federation, the Ukrainian government, the church, uh, the radical fundamentalists in these separatist groups, all having a, uh, a voice in this conflict. And usually where there's war, there isn't conversation, which is the reason why we're not seeing any mediation uh, coming from the United States or the NATO partners. Uh, the Pakistan prime minister and the Indian prime minister basically are trying, so is China, and now they're calling on Israel to try to mediate. But it just seems right during the conflict, immediately there was no talking going on. There was no uh, sitting down at the table at first. The only people who were trying to initially was Russia itself. Now, look, I'm not defending Vladimir Putin. He's a murderer. Uh, I don't know how many journalists and dissidents he's killed. And I just did a video, a short little video using Movie Maker. Yes, I'm primitive. Uh, where basically there was a tweet by Anna, uh, uh, Anna uh, Navarro Cord uh, Cardenas, who's basically a panelist on The View, where I saw her tweet, she says, I hate Vladimir Putin. And I looked at her and said, well, that's pretty hypocritical. What do you hate about Vladimir Putin? He's an authoritarian. Uh, he's basically an oligarch, a murderer. Well, guess what? You supported all those three in, in Barack Obama. This is not a hit on the left. This is not a hit on the right. This is not a hit on Putin or anything else. It's hypocrisy, which is going to be permanent in, in, the, in, in this conflict. Obama did the same thing. 
he basically authorized the intelligence agencies in the United States to spy on his own civilians, uh, collect their data and store it forever. He basically killed uh, tens of thousands in the Middle East on the premise of saving democracy in the Middle East countries, droning, striking, Arab countries. Where was the outrage from the left by then? So this defense of the Ukrainian government, this, this outrage against Putin just seems to be crocodile tears of the left itself. But we're going to see this with the right, with, with, the, with the Chinese conflict, which is eminent anytime soon. And if, it did not, if it's not China, it's going to be Iran. So it's almost like this, as we get near the, the, uh, the election in November, uh, we're going to see a rise in these uh, conflicts itself. I could be wrong about all this, but I look at history itself and I look at what people are saying and what they're not saying as a, a consistent finding within the hypocrisy of everyone involved. I don't know how it is abroad, but I that's how it is. Here. It, it is funny, isn't it, how like the American media finds the notion of humanitarian intervention in, into Ukraine by Russia ridiculous, right? But it, it's very comparable. Yeah. It might be ridiculous, but it's no more ridiculous than, say, I mean, probably the most comparable one is the American intervention into uh, Kosovo and the bombing of uh, Belgrade in Serbia. <laughs> so there's a complete acceptance. Of course, that was about protecting the poor people of Kosovo from the nasty Slobodan Milosevic. But it, it's just, it's incomprehensible, isn't it? Like even people are talking about false flags. Right? And it's always been acceptable, going back to the apartment bombings in the year 2000, which may well have been Russian false flags. It does a really good case for that. But John McCain was prepared to come out and, and make that accusation. Um, now, this is why, like, I always think, you know, I think we can both make a case for 9-11 being an inside job, and I think we can both make a case for it being all the things too. Sure. Okay, but my point is, like, had had 9-11 happened in Russia, John McCain would have been a no-planer, right? <laughs> like, they, they would have embraced every conspiracy theory going about it. Sure. sure. <laughs> and that, that, that's always just amazed me that... All the things that are completely unacceptable to say, all the perspectives that are completely unacceptable to hold about the government in Washington, D.C., as soon as Russia does it, that is completely the line that is taken for all of this. Sure. Well, I, my, I have a question for you. Seeing that um, that Russia is, is imminent in capturing Kiev, do you – now, this, this, is, this would be suicide on Russia's part. Do you see them continuing uh, eastward? Do you see them capturing the entire country? Right. And do you, would would this be? What do you think? So uh, I'm very reluctant to answer because one thing I've learned um, over the past couple of weeks is how wrong the preponderance of the alt media can be on these things. Because right. like you had a lot of people saying, "Oh no, he's never going to cross the border into Ukraine. Right. This is posturing," and not people who are who have no right to speak on the subject. People like Ray McGovern took that position, the, the CIA analyst who was a, a Russia specialist. And, um, you know, people are really respectable and, and for understandable reasons. And he's come out and, and accounted for what he got wrong there. So fine, okay, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a, a black mark against any of these people, but I'm, the, I just, I'm aware, I'm hearing a lot of people who are talking as if they're inside Vladimir Putin's head and they know what he's thinking and doing. And I think we have to recognize like, we're not, and we don't know what the strategy is right i mean if i was to to speculate from that i i would i would think that, that there has to be this has to be a limited incursion with some sort of exit strategy in terms of forcing negotiations because i don't see it as being um realistic to hold the ukraine for for a long period of time or it, how how would that be beneficial right i would imagine it's like the, the strategy is basically what Putin said in his speech, that it's the liberation of those two regions in the Donbass and to force some sort of repositioning over weapons. Now, weapon systems going into the Ukraine and, and no NATO membership. So what happens then when that's refused, okay? Or what happens when weapons are still pouring in from Poland and coming in from Germany? Then at some point you've got a justification, well, we now need to go into Poland to stop the weapon shipments. I'm not saying that will happen, but you can just see how this kind of thing can spiral out of hand. What happens if NATO start making incursions from one of the the countries like Estonia or Latvia? Okay, well now now there's a justification from there, right? So um, it's just it's very easy to see how. Like I imagine that 
there is some sort of exit strategy that Russia has to not make this a long-term thing. Because I, I don't buy into this is a resurrection of the Soviet empire, but I can also see how that could go badly wrong. And I also think, Adam, that there's a lot of people in Washington, D.C., who must be absolutely cock a hoop that this has happened. This is like, this is the neocon dream come true. Like Vladimir Putin yeah. has just made himself look in the eyes of the world, like the insane deranged monster that they've always told us he is. This is a, like a massive gift to the military industrial complex. Do you like, do you think the military budget's going to be cut now? <laughs> yes, this is a great point. The reason why I asked that question, Richard, because you thought when we spoke the other night, uh, you brought up a very intriguing point, which uh, is this is almost similar to when the communist bloc uh, basically took the, the capital Kabul in Afghanistan. And that probably you had similar mindsets about, well, uh, they can't be expanding. Are they going to be trying to control the Caspian Sea, for example? Are they trying to build a, a transnational pipeline? like the United States wanted to do afterwards. But um, you basically put up a point about how far are they willing to stay? The longer they stay, the worse off it is, is what you brought up the other day. And I said, that's absolutely right. I said in my head, He's, that's absolutely correct. Because we saw this uh, with the, um, the uh, communist government in Afghanistan, where they basically uh, got rid of the previous uh, communist dictators because they were bringing so much attention and slaughter to the native uh, Afghan pastors, where they precipitated this outrage of the global Islamic community, where they descended upon the country, and where the CIA basically conducted the largest operation, I believe, mm. in Operation Cyclone. Are we seeing that again? Yeah, um, well, the, I mean, the concern was that the Soviet Union goes into Afghanistan and they could move down and take Tehran ultimately and have access right. to the old oil fields and the Persian right. Gulf. And again, I, I don't think that's uh, my perception is the Soviet Union and now Russia has always perceived itself as being on the back foot and always thinks it's acting defensively. And that's always interpreted, honestly or otherwise, by the West as an incredibly aggressive action. So I think they were just trying to stabilize the lunatic communists in Kabul in in the eighties was the, that, that I think was the reason for the incursion. Then they just got completely stuck there and it's the same thing now. So like the only thing I'd say about that, Adam, is like, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that Vladimir Putin hasn't thought of that. Right. Cause it's like the, the thing you would think of like, well, how does this end and how's Washington going to react? Well, clearly they're going to want to do Afghanistan in the eighties 2.0. They're clearly going to want to like hold Russia in the Ukraine as long as possible. If they can get it to go into a bordering country, great. Um, although there is like, there is a danger there because if, if Poland became involved say I'm not saying they, they will, but then that's a, a NATO country and you've either got nuclear war or you've got to like actually acknowledge that NATO isn't really a defensive alliance that's going to protect Poland. Uh, so there is that, but certainly in the Ukraine, I think the strategy would be to hold them there as long as possible and bleed them as much as possible and get as much money funneled to Western arms manufacturers as possible. So presumably Putin is interpreting, uh, um, anticipating that, and has a kind of exit strategy, but it's certainly going to be the danger, yeah. Right, because this is a revisit of past history. Uh, history tends to repeat itself in many forms. So just, and incidentally enough, it was the, the Pakistan of the uh, Zeal ul Haq who negotiated or mediated a, a, a peace treaty between, uh, well, or to for Russia to uh, basically give up Kabul and leave the country. Two days ago, um, Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, visited uh, the uh, Russian government, actually, to try to mediate uh, a way and exit strategy out of the country peacefully. And whether, you know, Putin basically uh, has a, an exit strategy, I think what he wants to do is basically get rid of the, uh, the current government. And basically, according to him, and which is basically uh, reiterated in the, uh, the Guardian about um, uh, his wish to denazify the yeah. Ukrainian government and get rid of Volodymyr Zelensky uh, and basically put in a, a democratic elect, uh, government, which basically, you know, you have to put up your quotation marks, a democratically elect government. But I mean, who are we to say the United States basically saying, Oh, you, you know, our, you know, our democracy is the way to go forward. 
when our elections are basically, as you say, dubious itself. It's it's just like the comparison to Hitler is made with with Putin, and I can see sort of what yep. the sedate man thing. Okay, but you would think the obvious comparison would be Joseph Stalin. Like, so it's a continuation of Stalin, uh, not Hitler, because Hitler's right. completely the opposite. So it's, and I do wonder if this is like a certain contempt in the media for the great unwashed masses that just keep it simple, stick to Hitler. He might be the wrong dictator technically, but he is the archetypal embodiment of evil for the West. So don't put Stalin in. And also it's a rather uncomfortable fact because the, the, the West wants to think, America, Britain want to think that they might not have won a war in 70 years, but they did have that one great success in World War II where they saved the world from the Nazis. And if you talk about Joseph Stalin too much, it becomes apparent that we actually allied with who was then one of the greatest mass murderers in history <laughs> and handed yeah. him Eastern Europe. Um, so there's almost like, yeah, not wanting to compare, uh, to make this Putin-Stalin connection. And I think it's also what you say about like the denazification of the uh, the Ukraine, like again, Britain and America definitely like have this exaggerated sense of like how much they won the Second World War, right? When it's like twenty five million dead Russians that won right. the Second World War, okay? Um, and I don't think people necessarily get the, the Russian paranoia about Nazis, or why why would they not want Nazis, like? being politically active in a country next door to them because that didn't go well last time because well, no, the, the Ukraine is this big flat land and you can just march straight across it. So that's why Russia is like testy about that kind of thing and wanted this um, Warsaw Pact defensive barrier because European armies had twice in 20 years marched into Russia. Not to mention that we also have a long uh, standing pact with Russia, the mutually assured destruction pact. Whereas, because I'm, I'm starting to see this um, wave of paranoia about uh, a nuclear defensive strike against Russia. And this is coming from prominent leftist journalists on viral media. And I, I tend to like shake my head and I'm like, I'm wondering, is this fanaticism coming through either fear or paranoia or a twisted description of, of what they see Russia as. Is it an exaggeration through their own political history or their own political bias? Or is this basically just a natural reaction to fear because Russia is a nuclear, uh, a nuclear power? And unlike other countries that we have been in conflict with, Iraq, Afghanistan, basically the Middle East, the Arab uh, and Shia regions, where they're not nuclear, uh, where they are not nuclear ca capable. We are seeing a nuclear capable country. And there is that type of, well, you know what? I got a big brother too. So now the United States doesn't have that threatening, uh, 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 this, this threatening view about itself. So the, we're seeing this uh, almost this sheer fear of a a war that could basically end all life on Earth as we know it. I don't see it that way. I just don't see the Soviets willing to commit Harry Carry, if you will, or this martyrdom uh, operation. No, no, like Pu Putin's not insane. You have to like make out in the media to some degree he's insane to keep right. that paranoia around. Like it, it's interesting, it, it, isn't it? Like. It's funny, it's the first time I've ever had the thought, like, ugh, I really wish Ronald Reagan was back, because boy, does he look like a statesman now, right? The actor from California. <laughs> and I've never had that thought. I've never thought, like, of Reagan as anything other than this vicious murderer in Central America who upped the Cold War and ran up this massive budget deficit. But Reagan or Nixon or Kennedy, they all look like statesmen now compared to Biden, don't they? And you think, like, well, they understood that America was not the monopolar power in the world. And you actually have to negotiate and make concessions because the life of planet Earth hangs in the balance. And there's a hubris and arrogance of power now that I don't think American leaders had even through the Cold War. You know, the, the, the I don't know, we, we don't need to negotiate anymore. We can just bully and be belligerent and get our way through power and screw you. 
I think you're right. And this, this, it's interesting because you brought this up earlier about not having a legit uh, intelligent statesman, a head of state. I think the last time we had that probably in terms of uh, sheer intelligence, uh, and he's considered one of the most brilliant uh, presidents we've had mentally, even though I think he's a criminal, is Richard Nixon. After that, you saw the sheer degradation, slow degradation of leaders, Reagan, an actor, uh, Carter, who's basically uh, a shrewd uh, diplomat, a Saudi diplomat. And then we saw a real fall off because we had a CIA director as president in George Bush, mm. uh, Bill Clinton, a womanizer, a freelance womanizer. And then immediately afterwards, we went right off the rails because we had yeah. Bush, who's basically a Dauphin, a uh, guy who could probably sell pencils out of a cup. <laughs> Obama, Obama, basically uh, a constitutional lawyer and a, sh- a shrewd, very uh, shrewd uh, anti-constitutionalist. Uh, uh, and that's the reason why he was able to uh, basically erode civil liberties because he knew what was in the Constitution. And then, of course, the ultimate in Donald Trump. Uh, a guy who basically knows nothing about yeah, no, it's, I mean, that's what I'm saying about the comparison to Putin sitting down. I mean, you wonder what Obama would have been capable of. He never, you know, you could say Obama might have been an intelligent man, but he hit it very well. You know, he could yes. read over teleprompter, yeah. but you never really saw yeah, him sit right. down and talk about constitutional law or historical right. context or anything. And that that Putin did that. I mean, can you, can you imagine Trump doing that? Like, no, exactly, yeah. or even Joe Biden for that matter, because he's slow and he's older. And you you look at these, I mean, this is the reason why I think other countries look at us with disdain at this point, because when they see what these prop up leaders, and they're basically prop ups, because the real power lies behind them, and they don't want you to know who they are. So you get someone like a Trump or a Biden, and they see weakness, they see illiteracy, and they see other than what is basically a generalization of America in itself. And so when that happens, they, they perceive us as a country that is basically inept, uh, infa- uh, affable, um, grotesque in a matter in which we cannot dialogue. And the only thing we could do is kill and basically commit to war. And like you said before, um, it's basically that has replaced all diplomacy in the end. This is the reason why we're not at the table right now, uh, where we can have advisors and they basically, the president of the United States, basically give an hour long speech about what he wants in response. Uh, so I don't know whether this is going to be the way forward. If it is, we are in trouble. It's it's interesting what you say about Russia being a boogeyman for the left now, because historically that's not been its role. It's been a boogeyman for the political right. And actually, just coincidentally, I'm, I'm doing an episode on my Energy of Empire series at the minute about um, the United States relationship with Japan at the beginning of the 20th century and US encouragement of British direct support for Japan in its 1905 war with Russia. And why did Britain and America support it? Well, they, there was a great concern in the kind of Anglo-American establishment of the world in the future is going to be dominated either by Anglo-Saxon values or the real competitor is the Slav. It's, it's the Russian because of their massive landmass. They were industrializing at a rapid rate at that time. So support for Japan came because it's a proxy force that can knock out Russia in um, Manchuria and stop them coming down to the Korean Peninsula and stop them dominating East Asia then, whilst America's still getting its act together and getting over there and Britain's in China and, and so on. So it's just interesting that 100 years later, that 120 years, that, that concern is still there, right? That, that kind of same geo strategy still exists. And then the first Red Scare um, came in in the 1920s, and Russia was used as a way to, or not just Russia, but the, the idea of a communist octopus, the grand communist conspiracy theory, that they're, they're trying to take over the world. And I'm not saying that they weren't infiltrating communist parties abroad and, and trying to extend influence, but the, the mythology of that, that every, every labor organization in the world was had nothing to do with workers' rights. It was all to do with spreading the control of Moscow across the globe. Um, was used externally to smack any any anti-American corporatist government rising up, and internally to suppress workers' rights movements within the United States. And then you have the kind of, I would say, propaganda uh, put out by the John Birch Society about 
this grand communist conspiracy that was really, I think, and you can see this in like Chile in the seventies when, um, uh, oh, his name just left my mind. Who was the, the one that Pinochet threw out? It's going to bother me now, Adam. Um, Allende, Salvador Allende. Yeah. So there was all this, uh, the John Birch Society was churning out material on how he was connected to a giant communist conspiracy at the time and was going to bring Chile into oneness of the Soviet Union uh, and so on. And they were just pumping out CIA propaganda, essentially, that was being manufactured in Langley. So you see Russia playing this role, but then it's kind of switched in that it was a conspiracy aimed at the political right when Russia was communist. And then there's a little break in the 90s. And you saw this because like all the Russian wrestlers that have been the heels in the 80s suddenly became the good guys in the 90s, like uh, Nikita Koloff and such. And so you can always know what's going on in American uh, politics by watching the wrestling. And then it switches back when Russia becomes the boogeyman again around about 15, 20 years ago. But over the past 10 years, like through the Obama years, it kind of that it, uh, Russia became a boogeyman for the left. And then the Trump thing, the idea that Russia meddled in the election and brought the worst president in history to power, Donald Trump, has absolutely demonized Russia in the minds of the American, the kind of insane American left, the Rachel Maddow left, okay, to the point of just hysteria that they now can't get out of that spiral. And I think really it's all to do with aesthetics, right? Because Putin doesn't have the mask of compassion. Right. He doesn't, he, he look, he's a strong man. That's his kind of archetypal image. And I think what people really react to is not reality, it's images. Okay. So Justin Trudeau can do whatever with protesters in Canada. He can seal off their bank accounts from them. He can go to that level of authoritarianism, but he wears a mask of compassion. So the left are in that sense, psychologically incapable of ever rebelling against him because they're looking for a nurturing parent figure in state leaders and they can't, they can't see evil behind a mask of compassion. They can't see authoritarianism when, it, when it's a, a Justin Trudeau or a Jacinda Ahern. Um, but Putin doesn't wear that mask. So maybe that's why the right is not always having such a strong reaction to them because they like the kind of stern authoritarian figures. They're more inclined to that, whereas they hated Russia when it was a communist society and had all this talk about workers' rights and things. And um, so, yeah, I, I suspect that's it. I suspect that what you're seeing is just a response to images rather than realities in why there's been a shift. I think, that, I, I think, I don't want to really speculate on the future of what the, the new enemy is going to be. Because at this point, we really don't have like that face of the enemy, even though the national media in this country would like it to be either one of the three. It's either Russia, China, or the or Iran. Basically, um, I said the most realistic war on the horizon would be Iran. Uh, I think, in my opinion, the end of this conflict with Russia won't be so much as a... Uh, I think their exit is going to be when they finally find that mediator that they have commonality with and the United States respects. And I don't think it's going to be China. Uh, well, it might be Israel, to be honest with you, that finally gets through because they're still respected in both uh, the United States uh, because they're their lapdog, as well as the Soviet, I mean, Russia, Russia itself. So I think Israel might be able to, because Putin, I don't think, wants to hear from NATO and the allied coalition. They want to hear somebody who's on the outside, but is not affiliated. Now, yeah, Israel does have their links with the United States and the government itself, but uh, the Orthodox Church itself still has commonality in uh, lower Europe, Eastern Europe as well. And they still have a, a commonality with the government and I think Israel itself can finally try to dissipate peace because I don't think they want to see a conflict with Russia itself. I still think uh, the Gulf, Israel itself, want the conflict with Iran. And then what comes afterwards, uh, you know, they won't care because we still have that 
hatred for Iran itself. I could be dead wrong about this. And I, I always said, I asked uh, Scott Horton this once. I said, do you think Iran is the more realistic war? And this is before, this is like two months ago where, you know, the conflict didn't happen. And he basically said no. And uh, he thinks that the generals in the Pentagon are against it uh, because the geographic, uh, yeah. it's, you know, are, are, it's not feasible for American invasion. I had to agree with that because Lawrence Wilkerson, who I, and I interviewed, brought that up too. But um, who knows with the with the influence Israel still has in the country or the Gulf itself, that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, or not? I don't see a war with Russia because I think that's suicide. Mm. I don't see a war with China because that would involve a ground invasion or a cyber attack, uh, aerial assaults, and that would mean way too much. Although that would benefit the military industrial uh, complex and the industrial private industrial complex uh, enormously, by the way, Raytheon, LG3 Technologies, Boeing. So that would be uh, fundamental for them, as well as the Russian war. You know, any war would be beneficial for them. I think the more realistic approach would be Iran at this point, I want to say, but who knows? I think after the election of the Senate and the House in November, I think that's when we'll see a real invigilation of either a Russian, China, or Iran conflict. Is that something you share as well? Um, I think it's proxy wars, Adam. I think it's like fighting in a colony, essentially an American colony like Ukraine, where I don't think it's strategically possible for each side with the geography and such to have an Iraq style war in Iran, certainly not of Russia or China. So I think the future is more kind of proxy wars, where the, the weapons manufacturers can make their money, but America does become embroiled in an Iraq-style conflict. Hey, this is this is great. This is a great point because it leads into my argument against a global war, where you know the end is not right. So you have these proxy wars basically happening with these militias, small armed groups. Because I don't think the I don't think the Soviets retreat right away. I think they commit the same problems as they did in Afghanistan. I think we'll still see some remnants of the military in, say, Kiev. I don't think they go past, I don't think they, I, I really don't, I don't want to believe that they go past into, say, Poland or Moldova or in Romania. I, I just don't, it would be suicide. And, for, and that would involve the NATO countries. So there would be a response, a global, like a global response. Well, maybe. But it's not really clear what NATO would do to protect Poland. Like it could be, just, it could be completely empty as a security agreement. To like to mobilize the United States to go and defend Eastern Europe, you would have to convince the American populace that Russia poses like some threat to global security that is is so severe that it's like you have to do it now. Otherwise, after he's taken Europe, the ships are going to be sailing across the Atlantic to invade America or something. You, you, it, it, you'd need that level of uh, belief in Russian world domination. And I think there's too many people that don't believe that. And um, yeah, it, like NATO is really a way of subverting the US constitution right? because Congress has the war power unless Congress makes a one-time deal to get the United States into a binding treaty whether the, the war power essentially becomes automatic or it's, it's with the executive then you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I, I got you. So, and that's an incredible trick with, um, with NATO and with, like binding alliances like that are not really compatible with the U S constitution. Cause like the Congress today is bound to right. what Congress agreed in the 1940s. Right. I, 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 but then again, I, I, like I said, you know, and I, I can't say for a fact because I don't know, but I, I tend to not believe they go any more West. No, I don't, I don't think there's any intention of all, all I'm yeah, saying is like these things can, like Afghanistan, you can get embroiled in these things in a way it's hard to extract yourself from. Yeah. I think that's that point you raised the other night was so it, it stuck with me. Even when I was asleep, I was thinking, I said, he's, he's right. I think that they're, they're going to make the same mistake. And this is it's fascinating because you also said about Putin not realizing this, and you would think that he would. Now, whether it's his own ego 
or whether he refuses. I feel I feel he feels that his heels and by extension Russia's heels are, are over the edge. Right, he is backing over the edge of the cliff with this world empire of NATO and yeah, yeah. coming for him basically, and he has to do something. Otherwise, Russia is going to ultimately fall victim. They're going to be surrounded by nuclear missiles, um, unable to step out their own door, and it's ultimately going to be a color revolution in Mo Moscow. Will be, and that will be the end. Then the Western oligarchs just carve the country up, and it'll be back to the 1990s. So that I, I, I think it's it's kind of a desperate action because it, it, he sees himself as losing, and ultimately the world's succumbing to this monopolar entity, this monopolar power. So. I'm, I'm sure he's aware of like the possible entanglement. It's hard to imagine, you know, he wouldn't be. Um, but can he avoid it? That's another question. I'll tell you what's also interesting. We didn't, I didn't bring this up before, and I found to be quite remarkable, considering their their vitriolic history in the past. The uh, Ramazan uh, Katerov, the leader of the Chuch uh, Russia's Chechnya region. Uh, basically provided Chechnya fighters for the Russians to uh, capture or kill anybody in the Ukrainian government. To me, this was a fascinating revelation because of the long history they had in the uh, Chechnya wars uh, in the 1990s that you brought up mm. before. Uh, and to see them basically almost willingly just provide this assistance to Russia uh, defies belief. More than anything, I was more surprised at that than anything else. Mm. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last, but basically, it makes you wonder why they're giving their assistance. Whether it's basically because they also believe that they are going to denazify, denazify uh, the region itself. Uh, maybe Putin got them to believe that too. But re remember what their mindset is from. They're uh, ultra religious in its own right, the Chechen Muslims, um, and not to say that they're the same as they were in the in you know 22 years ago, uh, where they were committing atrocities left and right. Uh, but yeah, I, I, this is a, a profound revelation in my in my opinion. Okay, Adam. Probably we've been over now, so we should probably conclude the sure yeah. the recording. Yeah. Also, thank you very much, Neve, for that uh, enlightening chat and. I'm sure we'll be speaking about this again and all the oh, things going on. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, thank you, Richard. It was a great discussion. Great. Yeah. Thank you.